Welcome to Behavior Change Strategies. This is Lecture A. This unit focuses on designs of individual behavior change interventions and explains the importance of promoting or evaluating behavior change. There are four parts to this unit. The learning objectives for this lecture are to describe an overview of the current state of patient engagement and policy goals for the future. Discuss best practices for behavior change interventions. This is generally centered around the U.S. health systems. Patient-Centered Care, PCC, is defined by the Institute of Medicine in their groundbreaking report, Crossing the Quality Chasm, a New Health System for the 21st Century. They define patient-centered care as, quote, care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions, unquote. This contrasts in some respects with much of what happens in public health. In public health, we have global goals that are set for the broader society's benefit, and we impose them on most everybody else. In the patient-centered model, we actually start from the individual and work backward. On this slide is a picture of how an ideal patient-centered care is approached. First, we identify the need for such a program. We then engage the patient, and we try to build programs that allow for them to do self-management, have shared decision-making, and at best, coach. And this is consistent with a more liberal approach to how we engage patients. In other words, they're making the decisions for themselves, and we're merely providing education and supporting materials, rather than dictating to them how they might carry out their own health management. What was the impetus for patient-centered care? Well, this is a fairly recent change in the way care has been delivered in the U.S. Historically, we've treated the patient as a product, and you can actually see this when you go to hospitals and health systems around the world. Oftentimes, where the patient enters looks like a receiving dock. Where the caregivers, the doctors, the nurses, and administrators enter tends to be more elaborate, frankly, a more friendly entrance to the building. And this is because that's how the mindset was for many, many generations here. The patients took orders and followed what we did. However, public policy has moved dramatically in recent years because a lot of the systems that were in place were very expensive to run. In particular, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS for short, are moving to what's called value-based purchasing models, where they pay for patient outcomes instead of paying providers to deliver care processes. Let's focus on that for just one moment. The way we traditionally pay for health care was something called fee-for-service. You performed a procedure in a hospital or in a doctor's office, and we paid you for that procedure, irrespective of what the patient's actual outcome was as a health status change. That's no longer the case. We're now doing value-based purchasing, where we pay for better health outcomes. The other major change that has enabled this movement is the introduction of health information technology and the meaningful use of those programs, such as electronic health records, EHRs, personal health records, PHRs, etc., that allow doctors to interact with patients in new and different ways. And again, the government introduced a program called, quote, meaningful use, unquote, to incentivize both health systems largely hospitals, doctors, and medical groups to adopt electronic health records and other health information technologies to promote better care quality. Many payers are following the government initiatives with similar efforts. By payers, we mean insurance companies. Often when people go to the physician, the insurance company is the one who pays for the majority of those services rendered. You may have a small copay or coinsurance that an individual pays, but generally an insurance company is called a payer. The largest payer in the U.S., by the way, is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and that's why they are leading many of these efforts. Providers. By providers, we largely mean the clinical people engaged in delivering care and the organizations in which that setting is laid out. So, you think doctors and hospitals, by and large. 
And lastly, we have consumers, or as they used to be referred to, patients. And these are individuals who want more input into their care decisions. One question one might reasonably ask is, is there any evidence for patient-centered care's effectiveness? Most studies to date have been on a disease or risk factor specific. For example, diabetes is a very difficult disease to manage, and it tends to have bad outcomes, along with the fact that it also is very expensive to treat. Therefore, there's been a lot of evidence-based practice around diabetic care and seeing if diabetic care for groups and individuals can be done more effectively. Along those lines, there's a body of evidence that is mounting for effective PCC, that it can actually lower the cost of care delivery while simultaneously improving the outcomes that those consumers or patients receive. This is a win-win situation, to put it mildly. Where would one go to find some of these types of empirical evidence about what works in patient-centered care, the best practices that can be replicated? Well, there's good news on this. There's something called the Cochrane Collaborative, and you can go to the Internet and type in Cochrane Collaborative, and it will take you directly to their website, which is being updated continuously, as more and more studies that are engaged in patient-centered care are made available through the peer review process. To date, there are 41 studies that have used randomized control trials, which, in science, is the gold standard for assessing the quality of an intervention, a drug, a device, or any other medical activity for that matter. A randomized control trial is where we have at least two groups, one group who is not receiving the treatment and another group that is. In an ideal situation, both sets of individuals would be blind to whether or not they are receiving the treatment. You might think of a drug trial where everybody gets a pill. Half of the people are only getting a sugar pill, while the other half are actually getting a treatment, and then we see how the quality of their outcomes change over time. As mentioned earlier, there's been quite a lot of work done around diabetes in particular with respect to better control of people's lipids and cholesterol panels. And these are often referred to as HbA1c blood pressure and LDL tests. For those of you who know your cholesterol, all of those components figure into that in some way, shape, or form. Now, again, there have been five studies with interventions on variety of programs and value-based purchasing efforts. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are, in many respects, leading those efforts. The evidence base for patient-centered care is growing rapidly, and it's demonstrating many, many positive outcomes.